Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be with all of you. I appreciate you all being here. And to our guest, we want you to know how honored we are that you are with us. Um, we try to say this every Sunday for you as a guest. We want you to know how humbled we are that you're with us. And we also want you to know how encouraged we are that you are with us. We always seek as a congregation to be a source of encouragement, but you as a guest, you are a source of encouragement as well. And that's because you have chosen to give some of your time to this congregation. And we hope that you find it to be a place uh, that is full of God's love, uh, a place that, uh, that you feel warm and welcome, and that you feel comfortable wherever you may be in your journey that is faith, whether it's starting whether you're picking it back up after a break, uh, whether you have been in it for a while, whatever it is, we, we just want you to know we're glad that you're here. And whatever it took for you to get here, uh, however long it took, physically or emotionally or mentally, we are just thankful that you're here. To the members, thank you for being here to be an encouragement to one another and to build each other up through prayer and song and just spending time with one another. There's so much that life takes out of us that it's good to meet on the first day of the week for God to pour back into us and for us to pour back into one another. I'd ask that you'd remember tonight that if you have an opportunity, I know it's been announced and will be again, but as you have the opportunity tonight that you'll come back and that you'll join us in a time of song and praise and worship, uh, that, that we remember that singing uh, is vital to our Christian faith, not just in terms of how we do it, since that's been the focus for quite some time, but just the simple fact that we do it. We need reminders that Jesus loves us. So whether it's a simple song as that, or the fact that we need to be reminded that in Christ alone, our hope and our only hope is found, that's what songs do for us. And if you have the opportunity, we hope that you'll come back tonight, join us for that, and then you'll stay for a time of, fresh, of refreshment and fellowship. And as a reminder as well, for a couple of weeks ago, it asked everybody to set their timer to 9.38. It's based on Matthew, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus tells us to pray for those who would go out into the field of harvest. I hope that you will set that reminder and remember those who are participating in the fishers of men. Not everybody could do it this go around, and that's understandable, but everybody can pray. So please continue to pray for those classes. If you want to know who is involved in those and want to pray for them by name, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to Tom, and we'll be happy to share those names with you. But please remember them in your prayers. Several weeks ago, we started off this year with, with our theme. And we started with this verse that we want to remind ourselves of each time we gather together on a Sunday morning that comes from the New Living Translation with Moses in his third and final speech to the children of Israel. That as he points them back to God's word and knowing that they're about to move forward, he says that these instructions, a version of yours might say commandments, another version may say precepts, another version may just simply say words. Either way, that these instructions, these things that come from God, that they are not empty, they're not useless, they're not there to just take up space, they're not written down in vanity. That the things that God has made sure that we have, both testaments, that they are your life. And that by obeying them, you will enjoy a long life in the land that you will occupy when you cross the Jordan River. And our focus has been living the word. That we don't want to be a people that just digest God's word with our ears and take it in with our eyes. And then that's all it is. That God's word is meant to be lived out. That just as the breakfast that we ate to this morning was meant to be fuel for our body. So that we can go out and we can move our legs and move our arms and to live life to the fullest today. That God's word is not meant to just simply be something that we take in with our ears and have it bounce around in our mind. It's not something that we are to take in with our eyes and then just simply just take root in our heart and never produce anything. That we want to be a people that live out God's word. The way that that's described in both testaments is the word obedience. So we set forth two cornerstones for this year. That are going to make sure and that are going to help us stay on track, if you will, for living out God's word. One is that we need to come to trust God. 
most of the time when, this, when the word faith is used as a description, whether of an individual who's following God or a group of people that are following God, it is in the context of trust. That who I am obeying, why I am obeying, reveals at this moment, it reveals who I am actively trusting. Trusting myself, trusting someone else, or trusting the Lord. The other cornerstone is what we discussed two weeks ago about humility. That if we're going to live out God's word the way that he wants us all to live it out, and to find the blessing of enjoying a long life when we cross over into whatever phase of life it may be, that it's going to take an enormous amount of humility. An enormous amount. And it isn't a one-time enormous amount of humility. It is a daily enormous amount of humility. That every day I wake up and I, as I begin to live this life that's in front of me, I am not going to live by my own terms. Because if I have been, and I just take an inventory of that for myself, for my family, my faith, wherever it may be, if I live life according to how I see it, how I feel it, how I view it, it is not always going to live up to what I think it should be. But if we humble ourselves to God in faith and trust to the instructions that are not empty, we will find the long life that we want. We will find the strong faith that we pray for. We will find a family that is rooted deeply in the love of God to the point where maybe we can just for a moment grasp how deep and wide it truly is. But it's going to take an enormous amount of humility every day waking up of letting go of pride and humbling ourselves before Him. Those are our cornerstones in which every lesson would be filtered. Which brings us to our very first series of this calendar year. And the numerous directions in which we could go. But for the next several weeks, we're going to look at it from this angle. That we want to live out God's word through deeper discipleship. Now normally at the front, first of the year, we talk about reigniting faith. Making sure it's a deeper faith, more genuine, more authentic. Making sure that we can build ourselves up in that. And that would be a good place to start if we wanted to do it. And you might be wondering, well, why not? Why, why discipleship then? Why, why put a focus on that for the next several weeks should God allow that time to come and to go? Well, on one hand, we had 17 last year that obeyed the gospel. God's grace saved them through the blood of Christ and added them. To his kingdom. And it wasn't added and they didn't become just 17. The majority of us, the majority of us are disciples. When the New Testament writers wanted to describe those who actively followed Jesus, who actively lived out the word that God gives through Christ or that Christ himself gives, it's not the term Christian that is used. It is the term disciple. Over 269 times in your New Testament alone, the word disciple is used to describe the one who follows Christ. And it's not the one who gives his or her life to Christ. It is the one who follows. So if that is the case by just sheer number alone, would you say at this very moment that a disciple is the good adjective that would describe you today? And then second, if I may ask a most pointed question. Think back, whether you did it last year or you did it years ago. Just sit with this question for just a moment. When you became a disciple, would you say today that it was the best decision you made? Would you say it was the best decision you made? Yes. 
we make a lot of good decisions. A lot of us would say the best decision I made was when I bought that car. Because <laughs> it rides good. The best decision I made was when I took advantage of this job opportunity. And it opened many doors. The best decision we made was when we moved over here and it opened up an educational door and pathway for my children or grandchildren. And those are all well and good and needed. But above them all, would you say as of today that becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ was the best decision you have ever made? If not, maybe this series will reignite that decision. And if you haven't made that, stay with us. And perhaps, if you'll come and see, you may see Jesus in all of his glory. So as our text opens up, Jesus has decided to move on and go to Galilee where a lot of his ministry, his public ministry will take place. But he's in the very, very early stages. But he understands, Jesus understands that part of his mission, not the overall, but a secondary part of his mission is to gain followers. Because this faith that he is going to give birth, through, uh, birth to, based on his sacrifice on the cross and his teachings and so forth and so on, it needs people to pass it on. So he starts calling individuals. He starts saying things over and over. He finds key individuals Men that he knows that he wants to follow him. And to each one, whether it's a Philip, whether it's a Matthew, whether it's a Peter, whomever it is, they all hear the same call. It is, follow me. It's follow me. And what I want to do for us this morning, because the rest of the series of lessons is going to be more of a command format. That is a command, make no mistake about it. That if you are going to believe in Jesus, then discipleship is not an option. It is not something that I'm going to decide to do today. But maybe, maybe if, if things work out, I'll continue to do that. Now, if I, if I believe in Christ, I am a disciple of Christ. There is not an either or. There is not a, an option. The decision, the decision is made when you go down into the water. That's the beginning the discipleship. There is not an either or. But for our purposes this morning, I'd like to just cast it as an invitation. Do you realize how much of an honor it is that Jesus invites us to follow him? Just sit for a moment. That the one who is before everything. And the one in whom everything was created by. And everything was created for. And everything now hangs on his very word. Invites us to follow him. And there are a lot of us who struggle with this invitation. And at the top of that struggle is that we don't like the person that we see in the mirror. Because whether we say it out loud or not, we do operate with the thought, or at least the passing thought, I need to get my act together before I do this. Jesus doesn't wait for those whom he calls to get their act together. And then he calls them. The way I want to put this is that this invitation to follow Jesus is an invitation of grace and an invitation of love. We're going to put it this way. That Jesus sees the best and the worst of all of us right now at this very moment. He sees the best and he sees the worst of every single person in this room and on this world. And he invites us to follow him anyway. And the disciples become a petri dish of this statement. And we just landed on Nathaniel because Philip just can't help himself. He's got to go find his buddy. And he goes and he finds Nathaniel and he says, Nathaniel, we, we have found the one. All these years ago when Moses told us that there will be a prophet just like him and all these others spoke of this Messiah that would come, we finally found him. Well, who, 
Philip, who is he? Well, he's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And I want you to see at this very moment the worst of Nathanael. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? This is the worst of Nathanael at the moment. That at least is recorded for us. Nathanael comes across abrasive, doesn't he? A little snobby. Blunt. Matter of fact. There are some of us who have that personality trait. And sometimes it has served us very well. And other times it did not serve us very well. And you know what Jesus does with Nathaniel? He calls him anyway. The very worst of Nathaniel at this moment, at least that's, record, that's recorded for us, is a man who probably is more like sandpaper than he is cotton. Because that's very direct. Now, we're just reading a little bit into it, but I think you can kind of pick up the tone as you read it. But at the same time, when, when Jesus goes with Philip and Nathaniel's making his way, the text will say that Jesus saw Nathaniel coming towards him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. In other words, he, this is an Israelite, but he's, he's not like his father Jacob. He doesn't scheme his way out of things. He's, he's not a trickster. This idea is that Nathaniel is a man full of honesty and he's a full of integrity. That's the best of Nathaniel at this moment. And you know that when Jesus makes the call to follow him, whether it's to Philip, and we know by virtue of that it's extended to Nathaniel, that Jesus doesn't wait and say, Nathaniel, let's talk about your abrasiveness. Nathaniel, let's, let's go through a, a course of, uh, of self-help and make sure that we can kind of tone down that a little bit and maybe provide you a little bit of insight and wisdom when to be direct and when not to be direct. But we got a lot to work with because you're honest and you're full of integrity. Once we can get those ducks in a row, Nathaniel, then you can follow me. A lot of us treat ourselves that way. And we have a lot in common with the disciples. You know, James and John were very quick-tempered. So much so that they even suggested to Jesus, those who would oppose him, we got a great idea. We were talking. Would you like us to call down fire from heaven because these are against you? You think you have a quick temper. When's the last time that you suggested, let's call down fire from heaven? But they're quick tempered. And yet they are loyal to him. How about Peter? The perfect case study of it. Up and down discipleship. The best and the worst. The, the best when he listens to his brother Andrew and comes and accepts a name change. You're Cephas, but we're going to call you Peter. And he goes up and up and up. And finally, he reaches for a moment, the pinnacle. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for, for flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. That's the best of Peter. And you know what's the worst of Peter? You know what the worst is? I don't know this man. I don't, I've never seen him before. I've never been with him. That's the worst. And then you know what's the best? He preaches the first sermon. And you know what's the worst? He divides the church because he doesn't want to be seen with a certain amount of race and ethnic. And you know what the best is? He writes two letters at the end of his life, up and down. And there are some of us, there are some of us that we are so discouraged because our discipleship is up and down, up and down. We are at our best and we are at our worst. We are at our best and we are at our worst. And it's just this rhythm. Jesus must be so tired of me. Jesus must be so tired of us. But you know what today is? Follow me. That's why it's an invitation of grace. That's why it's an invitation of love. Because he sees the best and the worst of you right now. And he calls you anyway. He knows. If you're like James and John and are quick-tempered. And he knows if you're like Peter and one moment you are walking on water and the next moment you are on the verge of drowning. 
And he knows. He knows the struggle that you have. And letting go and laying down fishing nets and boats. And following him. He knows that there are those days where you wake up and you can move mountains with the faith that you have. And there are days where you just wonder how you're going to make it with the little boy's lunch. He knows. He knows those days. He knows those best moments where you truly loved your neighbor as you loved yourself. And it was revealed in kindness and in patience and in faithfulness. And he also knows those days where you woke up and it's, I just can't let this go. This person did such and such to me. I can't let it go. He sees the best and he sees the worst in every single one of us. And he says over and over at the beginning of each day, follow me. It's an invitation of grace. That's not just answered one time, but multiple times to everybody here. Whether you've been a disciple for just a few short months Or for numerous years. It's an invitation of grace. Born out of love. Follow me. But at the same time. It's an invitation to change. When Jesus has his meal. After he's invited himself over to Zacchaeus' house. So he broke protocol. Something that we learn when we are very little. You do not invite yourself over to anybody's house. You wait for the invitation to come. But Jesus invites himself over to a short man's house. Has what is a great dinner conversation. And at the end, this man is so changed by the presence of Jesus. In which Jesus gives us in that moment one of the great verses. And it gives us insight to the mission. To seek and to save the lost. The invitation to follow Jesus is because he came to find us. Where we are. But you've heard this before. But to not leave you where you are. Yes you may be quick tempered. But in following him. We find a way to hone that in. And to control that. Yes we may be abrasive. And direct. But under him and his tutelage. To follow him. We find a way in which that can be channeled. And used for positive. Yes. We have our moments. The best and the worst. But he doesn't leave us in the best and the worst. He follows us, but he follows us with the, he he calls us to follow him with the expectation, though, that we will change. Charlie shared a story with me earlier this week about watermelon. And he simply said this, and he heard it uh, prior to it, so he just passed it on. So I'll give him credit, and then we'll let him tell you where he got it from. You can see all the watermelon seeds in the watermelon. A lot of us want to have the one that has no seeds in it. You see all the watermelon seeds, don't you? How many watermelons do you see in those seeds? Maybe a lot. But you don't see them right now. You just see a bunch of seeds. But within that seed is the power to become however many watermelons God determines. That's the purpose of change. He sees the best and the worst in all of us. And in that invitation to follow him, that's full of grace and love and mercy. It's the invitation to change because he doesn't see you just as you are, but he sees you. If you will follow him, he sees you in what you will become. He sees you as the individual that you are not here yet, but with me Leading the way and you full of humility, wanting to give yourself over to the instructions that are your life. That as you cross over and stop being a Christian in name only, but being a disciple who gets up and follows, who is active in all of your ways. Jesus sees what you can become. But remember, it is not what the world would say in terms of what you become. You want to become a better father? Follow Jesus. You want to become a better husband? Follow Jesus. You want to become a better mother or wife? You follow Jesus. Because if you follow him, then you find what you want to become. Not the other way around. And that's the principle that we will see. The one who wants to save his life, if that's the goal, you're going to lose it. But the one who goes ahead and loses his life, he will find what he so desires, and that is to save it. It's the paradox of discipleship. But it's all the things that we want to become. 
It's all the things that we say and we look in the mirror and we take the inventory of the best and the worst of us. And especially the worst. And we say, I don't want to be that anymore. I want to become this. But do you trust yourself to become that or will you trust him so that you can become that? You want to become something? Follow him. And by following him, you will become what you've prayed about lately. Not yourself. Not the advice of the person you live with or work with. It's him. Follow him. But know this. There will be times where this change, or as the New Testament will use this word transformation, it will be comfortable at times. And actually it will be convenient at times. And it will be uncomfortable at times. And it will be inconvenient at times. It will be the hardest path you will walk. But we end where we began. If you follow him. And you humble yourself to him. In full trust. You won't have to think about the question that we asked at the beginning. You'll be able to shout it just like a few people did earlier. Was becoming a disciple of his the best decision you made? When you give yourself over to him, it won't have to be asked but just one time. Because you'll know what that answer is. The last thing is this. And it has quickly become one of my favorite verses to describe those post-resurrection of Jesus. That as the disciples are being persecuted and challenged, they have also in that three and a half years have been changed by following Jesus. We don't become disciples just simply so that we can attain something for ourselves. We become disciples so that others can become disciples through us. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. You want discipleship post-resurrection in three and a half years of teaching and miracles and conversations, early mornings and late nights, They had recognized that they had been with Jesus. And if you read from that moment, there are several who will follow Jesus because there are a group of people who decided to follow him. And they had recognized that they had been with Jesus. So if we could ask the people in our lives, what do you know about this disciple? Wonder if we can follow him in such a way that they would recognize that we have been with Jesus. That is discipleship. If you're ready to accept the invitation that is full of grace and love and mercy, but also is indicative of change, If you're ready to embark on that, then we want to encourage you this morning to rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, as he says in Acts 22 and verse 16. If you're not quite sure of that, but you have questions and you want to know more about this, let us know. We're all disciples. There's best and worst in all of us. And he calls us anyway. We can pray with you. If we can pray for you we can do anything, let us know as we stand and sing this morning.